Uh, hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm Lisa. I'm here today with my co-host Venkat. Um, and today we're talking about clocks. Yep, C for clocks. Yeah, so I'm going to get started with my clock. I think both of us brought a clock to show. Um, yep, so we're both clock makers. So we should let people know we're not just fans of clocks, but we're both bringing a clock to show that we actually built. Okay, yeah, uh, this is my clock. Um, yeah, so the moon clock is designed to show what the moon looks like. So you can see how it's um, mostly lit, but there's this part here that's not lit. Um, it, it's a kind of a slow art piece. You hang it on your wall and then over time it waxes and wanes like the moon outside. So I put in my coordinates and it, um, it'll also, it's supposed to show like the, um, it's supposed to like rotate. So the right side of it will be filled in. It's not just uh -huh. like whatever. Um, so why yeah, do you need so, the coordinates? Isn't the phase of the moon the same wherever in the world you are? Yes, but the directionality of it isn't. So in some parts of the world, they get like a boat shape crescent, whereas other parts of the world don't ever really see that. Um, so oh, the, okay. So it's a, it's a latitude thing, not a longitude thing. So the time doesn't matter, but north and south does. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, Australians and will see it upside down, right? Well, I mean, upside down to you, but yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and technically, elevation would matter, but when I was doing it, I punched it. Since this is so low... Um, as a okay, you, you're kind of getting ahead of yourself a little, so why don't you give us like a virtual teardown? Uh, I don't expect you to like open it up to show us the insides, unless you can. Finish. Oh, can that up. would be awesome. So if you can show us the insides, that would be great. But yeah, yeah sure. do us uh, do a virtual teardown for us. Let's um, learn how this clock works. Learn how the clock works, right? So the hardware that it's running on is a um, is a Raspberry Pi. It's the little guy. Um, so this is just the frame itself is just a um, it's like a printout of the moon basically. So it's kind of like <laughs> late shadow box um, printing. Mm -hmm. So you can, like if you get light behind it, the moon will light up, and then. The light that I put behind it, and I think this is just like an Ikea frame or something like that, um, like shadow box frame. And then behind it, I have a, um, a 32 by 32 um, LED display. Mm -hmm. And that is all driven by this Raspberry Pi um, that I have here. It's one of the, like the small Raspberry Pis that cost like $5. Oh, I guess it's being hidden by the hat. So I have like a little um, hat I bought from Adafruit that drives the LED thing and then the back of it's just a super tiny um, Raspberry Pi that's running. Um, so I wrote all the software for it in Go. So it's running my Go program. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the drawing software is in Python, just because that's what the library that the Adafruit like tutorial on how to get one of these running. running and you said on. this is all on board, but um, does that include the basic time signal? Like, are you running like a uh, quartz, like a timing chip in there, or are you getting like network time from a Wi-Fi connection or something? There is a real-time clock on this, like, so this little hat that I bought from Adafruit includes mm -hmm. a time clock. So oh, okay. It's got the timer included on it. So I had to do a little setup to get it, like, initialized at the beginning, but, um, yeah, otherwise it just uses the onboard time. I don't actually know how far it's drifted. I think it's been running for, like, a couple of years now. Um, uh, is it, but is it connected to the network or not? It, it's, no, there's no, there's no Wi-Fi. There's no. Oh, anything. okay. Uh, but didn't you have a website called moon.supply or something? So what is that? It's basically the code that tells you what the um, moon looks like is a Go library. Um, and so I set it up as an API that you could hit the endpoint with the latitude and longitude, and it would send you back a, a base 32 encoded like JPEG of the moon, like a 32 by 32 little um, square. So you could basically, if you had internet access, you could make your own moon clock using my Go code. Um, but you'd have to have like internet access to it. Um, and it just, okay. yeah. so, so what's the uh, algorithm between giving it the time and coordinates and the 32 by 32 grid that pops out the other end. So there's a bunch of like astronomical calculations in between, right? Yeah, so this is the book that I use to find the algorithms for, um, uh, for where given the time and your coordinates, um, figure out what the moon looks like at your position or your location. Um, it was actually kind of, it took, it was actually kind of difficult. Like I, I tried asking like all the astrophysicists in my life, um, mm -hmm. to help with this and none of them really knew any much about astronomy. 
which sort of confu like it confused me at the time because I didn't know anything about the field of like space and like astrophysics or anything. And so I thought, uh, but wait, there's a little bunny trail here that sounds interesting. You said all the astrophysicists in my life. How many astrophysicists do you know? I, think I know I like one. Three different people. Oh um, wow! Okay, that's yeah, about three more than average. Yeah, one of them is a works at NASA in like flight control and does like um, pathways of objects in space kind of thing. And he didn't really seem to know what I was asking for. Um, then the other two were a friends who had studied um, astronomy or like not astronomy but like the astrophysicists like stuff and whatever. Both of them work as programmers now. How did you discover this book? Did one of them recommend it or did you just find it on Google? No, I just found it. I think oh, I have okay. no idea how I found it, but I'm very glad I did. Um, I think if you do enough Googling about like moon and position of the bright limb, um, eventually you come across this. Um, yeah, I actually, so like figuring out this book, Scott, I think I ended up implementing like, so there's a bunch of different chapters and each one of them is like, has a slightly different thing that it does. Um, I think I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. Um, yep. It's like a different, it's a slightly different thing. So like something called nutation or something to figure out like where the position of the sun in the sky is, which is important for figuring out the shadow that it casts mm -hmm. on the moon. Um, so it was like a bunch of equations that I had to like each do each little module for. And so the hard part of the moon clock, at least the first pass of like getting the algorithm stuff written was figuring out what all different parts I needed to thread together in order to get the just like the, the results that I wanted mm -hmm. which was like a percentage of how much is full and then like the rotation of it um so that was like kind of an adventure but I, I think I think I got it Let's yeah see. that that sounds hard though it sounds like there would be a couple of ways to like fake it like you could just say you know this is the um, what is it the sidereal period of the moon is 29 days or whatever you can just set like a 29 day percentage approximation cycle. So that would be like a three line program, right? But on the other hand, if you want to do it very accurately, you'd have to like actually figure out the phase and illumination and all that stuff. Well, the part that I really wanted was the rotational part because I wanted it to actually look how it looks in the sky. Um, oh, okay. So that would be a light shining on a sphere from an angle. So you want to like get the, yeah. I think it's called the terminator line between the lighted and dark side. Sure. Right. <laughs> oh, speaking of the moon, by the way, did you hear the news? There's, um, they discovered uh, water on the moon. So this oh, yeah, I heard that. Or I saw people floating things, saw people floating things on Twitter about it. Um, yep, yeah. so that was uh, today as we are recording this, though this episode will go out in a couple of weeks, but today is when the news uh, came out. So apparently there's water there, but at a smaller concentration than the Sahara Desert. So not very much water. Yeah. All right. So what else is fun about this clock? I think that's about it. I think like, I don't know. How much does it cost? What would it cost to replicate your design? Uh, I, think like the, I think all the parts were about a hundred something dollars for some reason. Wait, was it really that much? You said the Raspberry Pi was a cheap $5 one and then you've got the frame. You've got the, the LED box. matrix. A picture a printout cost me like three to five to like 20. I got some fancy ones that cost more oh, okay. really high quality. And then the most expensive thing was actually finding the LED like square. Um, okay. I think that was like 30 or $40. So we add it all up, it gets close to a hundred, maybe not quite that much, but. Okay. Uh, but you were yeah. planning to like, then, like uh, sell this, stuff. right? Weren't you planning to like sell this to people at some point? Yeah, I was, I really wanted to manufacture it, but, um, I got really busy. I ended up changing jobs a few months into um, mm -hmm. having it done. I actually changed jobs like twice that year. This was like 2018 or something like that. Um, so right after, I think I finished the prototype in like October 2017 and then 2018, I ended up changing my jobs twice. Um, I was kind of like exploring how to make it manufacturing. I'd need to rewrite it and like, I think I was going to rewrite it and see. And then I was also trying to figure out how to um, get more um, Raspberry Pis, you can't really buy in bulk. They don't, that's not what they do. They like, they're supposed to be like hobbies stuff. Um, so I would have to rewrite it for like a different platform. And so I was working on the driver, getting a driver written for the LED stuff that I have on like a, um, STM board. 
Um, but I ended up switching jobs and like got involved in Bitcoin. And so I've been spending a lot of time on the Bitcoin or lightning spec stuff over mm -hmm. the last few years. And this has been on a back burner. So at some point. Yeah, this would be actually a fun clock to sell. I would buy it, like, though not at a hundred bucks, but I would buy it for like maybe 30 bucks. Uh, but I think you could get the price down to that much. I mean, it depends on how you sell it, right? Like, I think if I, if you think, I think you're thinking of it as like a clock, like a moon thing. Um, I think if I really like pitch it as like an art piece, which is what I intend for it to be, as like an in home art piece, I think people spend a little bit more on art than they do on clocks. Yeah, I think that's true. But if you want to sell it as an art piece, I think the lighting will probably need to be better or more expensive. So maybe brighter LEDs, because uh, I did notice that the light and shadow difference is not that dramatic on your thing. Or maybe it's the backlighting in your room right now. But well, yeah, it's it's, yeah. You can see the moon in the daylight. <laughs> like that's true. Uh, yeah. So is it really bright at night? Like if it were in a darkened room, it, it shows up much better? Yeah. And actually, like, I had a friend who complained to me, they're like, hey, does this have, like, a brightness setting? We need to turn it down because we had it in our bedroom. Wow. Okay. On moon at nights, it's really bright, but on dark nights. So, <laughs> okay, got it. Got experience it. of how bright it is changes over time. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm signing up for um, the beta release when you manufacture it. 2022, it'll be there, you know. That's the thing. All right. So, are we talking about my clock now? Yeah, let's talk about your clock, Vinka. Let's talk about my clock. All right, so I'm going to do something fancy and switch cameras right now. All right, so this is my clock. And oh. obviously it's way more complex and better in every way than your clock, but that's because... It's, it looks way fancier. It looks much more complicated. But right I can't that. claim to have designed it or anything. I made it out of a kit. So the kit is uh, $45. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, just kidding. It's a mechanical clock. So I wanted to really like get an intuition for how like the you know original mechanical clocks worked and this was the kit i found i've now found another kit for like 99 dollars, which is closer to the original hygiene's uh, pendulum clock but this is pretty close so uh, building it so this whole thing is uh basically laser cut uh, laminate sheets so the kit is four or five sheets of like laser cut things and you pop out the parts and then you assemble like seven or eight gears. I wrote a blog, blog post about it. So you assemble like eight gears. So there's eight gears in the train and they connect up to that uh, pendulum mechanism. So that's the sort of um, interesting part about how this works. So actually maybe I'll do a little demo. I don't know if I should, but let me just point out how this works right now. So if yeah. you see the part at the top, the little rocking thing, that's mm. called the anchor escapement mechanism. So you can see the top looks kind of like an anchor, like you know the uh, bottom of an anchor. And the toothed wheel that you see like going jerkily, that's called the escape wheel. So basically mm. the way a pendulum clock works is if you look at the bottom left, where you might be able to see a metal key, that's the wind up key. So when you wind that up, there's a ratchet gear there and a mainspring, so it winds up the spring. Now, mm -hmm. if the pendulum and that little rocking mechanism wasn't there, what would happen is it would just go brrr and the whole spring would un unwind immediately. But what the escapement mechanism does is it sort of periodically lets the uh, gear train escapes and then captures it again. That's why it's called the escapement. So the toothed wheel, as you can see on one end, when it catches the little notch-like thing, that kind of stops it. But then it's just strong enough to push it out of the way. And in the process, it gives the pendulum a little push but then the pendulum swings back and traps the escape wheel again. So that's kind of how this works. So uh, let me actually try one thing. Let's see if this works. It's going to be a little bit of a stunt. I'm going to switch to the microphone that's on that other camera and show what happens when I take the pendulum itself off. So I might not be coming through very clearly, but what I'm going to do is jam a pen into this gear mechanism here so it doesn't like spin randomly. So I'm stopping it. I'm going to remove this here. So the pendulum comes right out. Okay, so you've taken the pendulum Okay, so off. I took the pendulum out, okay? Yeah. Um, this is what's going to happen. Oh my gosh, it's in like... Well, time is sped up, Venkat. Yep, like... so now it's basically the mainspring is unwinding completely. Wow. How much time is that one spring worth? I'm back at my other microphone. So you can see it takes about 20... 
30 seconds to run out of energy. So this was almost fully wound. So it's not a, it's a, it's a kit clock and it's not meant to run 24 hours. So fully wound up the spring will drive it for about six hours. And uh -huh. as, you see, as you can see, it's, um, if I just release it, it takes about 30, 40 seconds to run out. So this was kind of like interesting for me to kind of actually get, get the intuition of how the pendulum regulates the gear train and how much energy is stored up. So it's kind of fun to think of it as when you wind it up, it takes like maybe you know 20 seconds to wind up a spring. So, and you're exerting like muscle force of maybe, I don't know, five pounds. And you're storing up enough energy that if you let it go, the inertia of the gear train basically is a load that will run out in like 30 seconds. So right now it took about 30 seconds to run out. But because of the escapement mechanism, that energy is kind of like trickled out over six hours. So that's kind of how it works. And until I actually built this, it was like, I had a vague idea of how pendulum clocks work, but I don't. So here's my sort of short TLDR of how these things work right now. And I'm going to try to actually design like an absolutely simple version of this without like seven gears and stuff. So as simple as I can get it. But the simplest way to think of it is you've got a spring that winds up um, one gear, okay? And if left to itself, that'll just go brrr and unwind. And this thing sort of just catches, uh, release, catch, release, catch at the frequency set by the natural frequency of the pendulum. So that's kind of how you basically convert uh, the gravitational constant of you know, 9.8 seconds per meter square that turns into a regulated time signal this way. This pendulum uh, is about 25 centimeters uh, long and that makes it uh, a second pendulum. So its oscillation period is about one second. Anyway, mm -hmm. so that's my pendulum clock and I'll switch back to my video here. Cool. All right. So those are our two clocks for today. Those are clocks for today. That's great. No. Uh, I just bought a little digital clock kit to learn how digital clocks work. So I'll be catching up with you on sophistication. So right now I'm somewhere in like the 1650s in terms of technology and you are in Raspberry Pi. So 2010. Yeah. So I have to catch, I have some catching up to do. So <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. Um, you said you're building a digital clock. Uh, Briefly last week, um, after the last episode, we were talking a bit about um, how modern clocks are driven by the Hertz cycle of, well, not even modern, like maybe this is more like 80s and 90s clock, digital clocks. It's actually, it goes back to the 1920s. Actually, I just pulled up, uh, let me share my screen. I just, I did a talk on this. Can you let me share my screen? I think you, you're the host now. Yeah, sure. So I did this talk, I think in, was it 2018 or 2019? So this is the book I'm working on, but I want to like uh, show a couple of pictures from this talk. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks great. I can see it coming through. Oh yeah. Okay. So this is the one, uh, Telecron. This is one of the earliest uh, grid driven electric clocks. And this is, uh, this image kind of is um, interesting to me because it surprised me at the time to see uh, analog dial because we are used to thinking of like grid driven bedside um, alarm clocks as you know, the little square boxes with like red LED uh, numerical displays, right? But the first grid driven electric clocks actually looked like analog clock faces. So this, were, this is I think from the 1920s or 30s. So basically, yeah, like we discussed last time, the way it works is the electric grid works at 60, 60 Hertz. So if you count off 60 cycles of the alternating current, that's mm -hmm. one second. So you can use that to drive a clock. Oh, and uh, let me flash a couple more different interesting clocks. This is Loran. So Loran was before GPS, the ranging system that ships used for navigation. That also had a timing signal. And this is the uh, atomic clock that flies on GPS satellites. So it's a rubidium atomic clock. Wow, that's cool. Uh, my clock making hobby, hopefully at some point, I'll get to the point where I can uh, try and make one version of all these clocks. You'll see how far I get. I'll skip the moon clock phase since you've already done that. Yeah, the moon clock's a little different too because um, it depends on a clock, right? It's clock dependent, so I need It doesn't someone... need to though, you could, you could drive it the other way, right? Like you could have a telescope uh, pointed at the moon and use the phase to determine the date, kinda. Like you use a sundial, a moon dial. That seems really, 
I mean, the moon goes away sometimes, so you would not yeah. have it pointed at half the Same day. Same as a sundial. I mean, that's, these are bad as actual clocks, but they're kind of fun to think about, right? It's like any, any periodic signal can be a clock and well, the signal may not always be available. You were at, um, yeah, you were at the uh, 2019 refactor camp, right? Remember the guy who did the talk on the uh, galactic second tick day. So he called it yes. the galactic tick day. That was hilarious. Like one tick of the sun going around the galaxy. So yeah, that, that's probably the biggest, slowest clock you can kind of think of at a human scale. And how often, do you remember how often they came up? I think it comes up every 200 odd days or something. So one galactic tick is about 200 days. So for those who are, um, who don't know what we're talking about. So the idea is that the solar system sort of revolves around the galaxy. And if you treat that as like one, the equivalent of a galactic year, the galactic tick is uh, sort of the equivalent of a second on that clock. And right. it, it takes like a couple of hundred years, I think. I think, or I could be wrong, but I'll have to look it up again. But that was fun. Any other cool. thoughts on clocks? I think that's everything I had. Um, I, like the, I mean, I've, I've, there's so much like clock trivia. Um, I think one of the more interesting things I learned while building, well, it's not, it's not that fancy, but um, while building the moon clock and doing all the algorithms for the um, moon stuff is that one, the alg every algorithm that I've written into the moon clock is going to be wrong at some point in the future um, because most of them are approximations. We don't have like, we don't have hard, um, in non-variating uh, non like algorithms for predicting where the planets are gonna be in relation to each other. So all of the algorithms that we have kind of have like unspecified expiration dates. Some of them are a few hundred years yep. in the future. Some of them are a few thousand years in the future. But at some point, every, um, every algorithm that we have for figuring out where the planets are needs basically has to be updated um, based on new observations. Um, and so people used to do a lot of work on this in like the 18 and early 1900s, but as far as I know, I'm, I'm sure people are keeping track of it, hopefully, but at some point we will need, um, we will need a new raft of astronomers or astronomical data to help us build new, new Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's the basic problem of a three body problem, like the two body problem yeah. is solved and it has an analytical sort of closed form solution for simple orbits. And if you just wanted to do the earth moon system, that's sort of, you can, you know, project it far out in the future. But unfortunately the earth moon sun is a three body problem. And then Jupiter at some point has a weak influence. So you have a four body problem. So yeah, all those um, drift at a particular rate. And uh, when I took um, the astrodynamics course uh, back in grad school, one of the things that they taught us that was interesting was for most normal differential equation sort of calculations, it's okay to use like uh, what's known as ODE 23 or ODE 45, so low order approximations. But when you're doing like astronomical projections, people use like sixth or seventh order, like extremely high precision uh, mm -hmm. uh, numerical integration routines, because those like, you know, uh, higher order equations, the more precision you can get in the integration, at least you can eliminate that source of error and you can get to like, you know, hundreds of years. And I saw a little bit of um, that trying to build my clock, which is uh, when I, it took a long time to get it running for its full length of six hours per wind up. Like when yeah. I first assembled the thing and started it running, it ran for like 10 seconds and then stopped. Then I fine tuned it, it got to a minute and half an hour. It took like a lot of uh, fine tuning before it got to like uh, its full run length of six hours for the mainspring wind up. And that's because there's a lot of frictions, misalignments, even the tiniest little things can basically stop it. And in a way that's a mechanical analog to numerical integration on a computer, because that's what this thing is. It's kind of like a mechanical contraption that does integration of um, the pendulum swing, right? And right. the tiniest frictions kind of like blow it up. Yeah, your air, the air rates at the edges really matter, right? Because it compounds to... Exactly. And especially because these are like, you know, four body problem type equation in the astronomy case, and you'll become very sensitive to initial conditions. Yeah. Exactly. All right.
So I will have more to say about clocks on future episodes. I look forward to it. Uh, so time will only tell us. So it will reveal to us what you have to say about clocks. <laughs> Are you, are you planning to make more clocks or is the loom moon clock your last one? I don't have plans to make more clocks right now. Um, I have no plans to make more clocks. Um, so do we know what we're talking about next week or are we going to pull it out of a... Oh, we'll have to wing it. D, I don't know what topics we have for D. Well, I, if I've managed to finish building my digital clock in time, we can talk about digital clocks. But we already talked about digital clocks a little bit with yours today. Yeah, a little bit. All right, so we'll see. We'll see. All right. All right, thank you. Right. It's a pleasure. See you next week. Always a pleasure. Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.